Uh, today is September 26, 2008. My name is Julian Reitman, and it's my pleasure to interview David Wise at his home in Stanford, and I've been looking forward to this initial trial for the Jewish Historical Society of Lower Fairfield County. And on that note, David, uh, why don't we start sort of with your name, background, where you were born, and a few things like that. Okay. Well, uh, I share your uh, uh, pleasure in participating in this uh, very, very worthwhile project. I really feel that way. I am David Wise. I'm 79. I was born in New Haven on May 19, 1929. Uh, but that's where my mother chose to have the babies. I am a Stanford resident. We lived in Stanford before I was born, and I am a Stanford person my entire life. Uh, my, we uh, lived at 124 Lafayette Street to begin with. Uh, my dad's name is George. He's dead. My mother's name is Marion. She's dead. I have a brother, Bob. He's uh, two and a half years older than I am. Uh, he is uh, 81, I'm 79. And uh, we're both lawyers. My dad was a lawyer. My brother joined my father in 1952. I in 1954. And all on a handshake, no partnership agreement. When my father left in 1960, he was appointed to a judgeship. My brother and I shook hands again, uh, and to this day, uh, we remain partners, although in all honesty, there's very little, if nothing, to do. <laughs> well, since you were born in Stanford, uh, how about uh, your early education? Uh, public education throughout. Uh, Roger School, kindergarten, through the ninth grade. Stanford High School uh, graduated in 1946. Uh, UConn graduated in 1950. Bo uh, Boston University Law School graduated in 1953. And do you have any particular memories uh, associated with uh, you know, what it was like at Rogers School at that time and so on? Yeah, I do. Uh, most of them good, some of them uh, not so good. It's interesting that throughout my life, uh, some of the unpleasant memories are the ones that remain more specifically than the pleasant ones. Uh, I love sports very much. Learned to play the sports in the, in, in, on Lafayette Street, then in the playground of Rogers School. Uh, there are some specific memories in Rogers School uh, that first uh, exposed me to anti-Semitism. And this is something that was the beginning of experiences that marked me and my attitudes and my thoughts to, as we speak today. Always walked back and forth to school. On a couple of occasions when I'm walking to Rogers School, there's this kid, older, you know, walking back. And uh, I heard all the words. I heard all the words, slapped me around, and I never knew what to make of it. And uh, I would cry, I would run away, things of that nature. And I always wondered, what the heck is that all about? And I would tell my mother, and she told me what it was all about. And I don't have to get specific in this. Uh, I think everybody has had some of this. Um, the, the, there's a specific incident in the fourth grade. And the fourth grade teacher was uh, Miss Gallagher. And I loved Christmas music, the carols, the music and I knew all the words. Uh, and she would always insist, 
and it was welcome that the kids stand up and sing the Christmas carols, okay? I had no problem with that. But when it came to uh, the Lord Jesus or statements of that nature, I just was silent. Otherwise, I stood up and I sang along, happened to have had a beautiful voice, and she saw that, and she singled me out, and she hum uh, humiliated me uh, in front of the class, and interestingly, there were some people in the class, kids, that came over to me, not Jewish kids, who felt, uh, well, I'm not sure how they would have characterized the way they felt, but I felt that they felt bad for me. That was a bad experience followed by almost a simultaneous good experience. In the uh, ninth grade, I was friends uh, with a fellow by the name of Art Stratton. But to this day, if we see each other, we remember each other. Uh, he was a member of the Stanford Yacht Club. <laughs> I'm laughing now because <laughs> people of my age understand the historical significance of that. And uh, he said, you know, we've got bowling alleys there. <laughs> he said, would you like to come some afternoon bowl? I loved it, you know. <laughs> yeah, come on, all right, let's bowl. So we go down, the bowling alley is down below. And we're there for about 10 or 15 minutes. And this, uh, um, I guess he was the manager or something. He says, Art, young Mr. Stratton, he says, you and your friend, you have to leave. And I said, why? I said, young man, don't ask me why. You, would, <laughs> you have to leave. I figured it out. And then I said, I just don't understand. How do these people know things like this? You know, how do they know things like this? And you know, just last night, for today, I had neglected to put that down on my list of memorable events. And I figured it out. You had to sign in. The last name is Wise. That name then, it was so well known in Stanford, that had to be the reason. So, uh, but I had good times growing up, believe me, in Rogers School and throughout. So that took care of Rogers School, anyhow. And what sort of sports did you do in high school? Uh, baseball was my thing. And uh, in those days, Jewish kids were kind of told by older Jewish kids, don't waste your time, don't go out for teams, you're never going to make it. Uh, I, I guess I believe what they were saying, but I never subscribed to that. And I was very young, my mother skipped me a grade, so I started at, uh, uh, figure it out, I graduated at age 17, but just having turned 17 in May, so I was chronologically or physically developed always a year behind. So I tried out uh, in my sophomore year, didn't make it. Went again in my junior year, did make it, but I made it as a scrub and then I started and I was a varsity player both years, but really in my senior year. That was a major, major accomplishment. It's something that I'm very proud of because, and I was a middle kind of ball player, you know, they were better and then not as good, and then uh, not as good as. But it was a one high school town, and to be a varsity baseball player was uh, a big deal. Some younger Jewish kids from the neighborhood looked up to me, I found out later, as a result of that. Just that I had looked up to people like, uh, Bobby Queskin, that name will come up in my story. Uh, uh, Ali Alter, Murph Weingrad, any number of, uh, of men that came back from World War II uh, at the same time that my brother did come back, but, and we would all play basketball. So those memories are fantastic. I'll tell you about them later if the occasion arises. I guess we want to continue on to Yukon. How, how was stores in those days? Uh, uh, keeping in mind, well, I never had any negative uh, uh, anti-Semitism experiences, nothing like that. But I started in 1946 
Now, mind you, I'm 17, that's all I am. And that was the first year of the GI Bill. So the returning veterans, and they truly were veterans, uh, they came back, and they're men. Uh, couldn't get a date, or maybe if I could have gotten a date, I always thought, well, why would the hell would they go out with me? <laughs> and all of that. So from a social point of view, it, it, it wasn't so good. Uh, but so, uh, there was intramural softball, intramural basket, uh, basketball, played that way, had a good time. And I actually, because this is something I learned about sports, if you, if, if you want something, you have to try. If you win, you win. It. If you fail, you try it. So I, I went out for the, for the freshman team, you know. And a man by the name, he, the late Hugh Greer, he became the head basketball coach. He took a real interest in me. He gave me such a shot to make that team. But I was like four or five teenagers to try to make that freshman team. None of us did. And he came over to me and he treated me unlike the way the high school coach treated me. He knew how much it meant. So this is memorable, actually. And uh, as I said, he gave me every chance and he said, but David, I just can't put you on. There are others that are better than you and I, I think you understand that. I thanked him for talking to me in the fashion that he did. And then he said, but I do want to tell you one more thing. He said, I never saw a kid who'd run down at first base with his feet moving so fast but covering less ground <laughs> than you, but it was endearing. Uh, I was in Boston about the time you were, and I remember anti-Semitism in Boston at that time. Oh, you better believe it. This is uh, when uh, uh, Golda Meir, okay, she comes to Boston, I go to watch, all right, and she's walking around the Boston uh, Common area. They booed her. You know who the they are. Yep. They booed her. That year, or, or uh, probably that year, or within a year, Remember the infamous City College team that won the NCAA and the NIT? And then they were found to be gambling, some of them. But always controlling the point spread, but never to lose, but always to win, and they did. And I think they may have been undefeated for both of those years. They came in to play Holy Cross. That game, and Holy Cross was Cousy, Kafton, Mullaney, uh, a, bu a bunch of names. And it was at the Boston Arena, not the Boston Garden. The Boston Arena was a bandbox. It was full of uh, all kinds of people. None of them was like me. <laughs> and City College kicked the crap out of them. And the more they kicked the crap, and this was before the scandals were made known. Uh, they, they, they played New York basketball. New York basketball was the basketball board before Indiana was a state, for goodness sake. <laughs> they couldn't handle it. And they booed and they yelled all the epithets and all this kind of stuff and threw the beer cans. And the more they did that, the more I could And that's that. Uh, well, uh, I guess we ought to then switch back to the uh, social life, uh, yeah. um, sort of uh, what was the social life as you were growing up? Who did you meet? Who did you go out with? So yeah. Uh, back in those days, um, and all my contemporaries, in, 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 in including uh, Lester Sherlock, who was videotaping this, um, there was a core to Stanford. Uh, that core disappeared and was never replaced. There were neighborhoods. Uh, not everybody loved everybody. That's true, but everybody knew everybody. And there was one pivotal street, and you all know about it, it was Pacific Street. 
that's where Grandpa Wise had Wise's Paint Store. And there were so many stores on both sides. There were Rimland's Carps, Brazel's, Chosky's. There were the Italian uh, fish market, the uh, Lou, Chicken Lou Frateroli had the chicken market down below. There were saloons, there was everything. It was the street, the most important street. Well, I emphasize that because uh, you walked everywhere, okay? So, and I lived on Lafayette Street, so it was no big deal to get to Pacific Street, walk down, or pick up what you needed to pick up. But when you'd go there, okay, it wasn't, at least for me, it wasn't just going into Wise's Paint Store to see my grandpa and my aunt and my uncle. Where were you? I mean, you said hello. People knew me, I knew them, and that's just the way it was. And I'll talk about Charlock, and I'll talk about Lester's father-in-law uh, uh, later on. And so that was part of it. Um, on the street that you lived, you knew everybody. Lafayette Street, uh, the Lostings, the, the, uh, the Wassermans. Goshberg's father, the tailor, down at the bottom of the hill. Bobby Kahn, his father had a, uh, like a, like a convenience store at the bottom of the hill. Bobby Kahn wanted to go to medical school. All right? He became an accountant because the quota system was in force. Like in those days, but we see, we all knew things like that. We all knew things like that. But it was a pretty homogeneous neighborhood. It really was. And that was a good thing. It wasn't monopolized by any particular group. I know that Colonel Sid Perel lived next door to us. We were at 124 Lafayette Street. When they, when they sold, uh, the Hogan family came in, or maybe the Hogan family lived upstairs. It was reasonably mixed. Nice, wonderful, warm memories. The Stanford Jewish Center, Grove Street. Okay. A pivotal place, pivotal place, absolutely. Uh, you knew you'd see, you know, you can be a member of any particular ethnic group and you don't have to love everybody in that group and they don't have to love you, but they were all there. They were all there. So, going there, uh, first time I ever swam naked was in a swimming pool. <laughs> Just think about that, I'm a kid. Right, but everybody was naked in that swimming pool, but we swam there. Pete Queskin downstairs with the bowling alleys. Uh, and I set up pins there, I'm not the only one. He'd give us 10 cents a rack, and then he would bet us when we would bowl the 10 cents. He always got the 10 cents back. And then he had the pool tables upstairs someplace, you know. And he always made sure, <laughs> I mean, if there was anybody upstairs and nobody downstairs, he went upstairs, downstairs, upstairs, downstairs. But there was consistency. You know, you, you knew what you could count on. I mean, it's, it's kind of like retrospective thinking. All the subliminal stuff that's in there all the time, you don't know the why or how it came to be, but it emerges. That's why I had the memories that I had. So, they were great days, great days. Uh, people like uh, uh, Murray Goldenberg, a very, very important man as far as I'm concerned. Because that man took no crap from anybody, anybody. And he had the pushed in nose to show it, okay? And he had no patience for, for, he understood when kids wouldn't stand up, but he had no patience for uh, not trying to do something about that to see if he could fortify some of us, me included, by the way. Because I have to tell you that when I told you about going back and forth to Rogers School and the incident in the fourth grade, uh, I was a fearful kid. I, I did try to do certain things about that. I was unsuccessful at it. And that reinforced uh, the fear. And I will also acknowledge that I became ashamed. I became ashamed. And I, uh, I have no problem talking about this. I've, talk, I've had lots of talks, never preaching to my own kids. But they know my story. And uh, 
before, during, and after, as does Sandy, as to, did my mother and my father. And I was able to, uh, you know, like when I would go home in tears, my mother would say, and she was a pint-sized lady, but she was a fearless lady. And I, just think about telling your mother I'm ashamed. I'm ashamed of being a Jew, okay? She had some words to say about that, and little by little, I came through it, got to the other side, and I became a, uh, a taller then, but a mini uh, Murray Goldenberg. <laughs> I can tell you about that later on in my life as well. And uh, in terms of uh, Jewish education? Uh, the kind, uh, here, here's what that was, all right? Um, like other men of his generation, including several who got here before Grandpa Wise got here, uh, the these men were incredible men, incredible men, for a variety of reasons, but I just know about my grandpa and I know about my father. Um, I didn't go to Hebrew school, but my mother kept a kosher home in respect, out of respect for grandma-wise, uh, a literal kosher home, uh, until she died. We lived around the corner from Grandpa Wise. We lived on Lafayette Street, he lived on Crystal, Crystal Street. And because whatever the chemistry was, uh, there was, it was never obligatory for me to go over and spend time with Grandma and Grandpa Wise. Uh, my memories of that uh, are priceless. And so what did he teach me? In the most indirect way, uh, I have come close, come close to modeling him and my father because it started with grandpa. I had to start with grandpa to my father, to me. So the kind of religious education, Jewish education I got was more from what he didn't say, from what he didn't say, because he never preached. Uh, and it was just who he was in his essence, and the same thing with Grandma, and what it was like for the satyrs. And the satyrs at his house was the first satyr, because that was the Y side. The second satyr was my Aunt Mildred and Uncle Charles. Um, that's my mother's side. Those two sides <laughs> didn't have that much in common. <laughs> <laughs> it was just a euphemism for saying that maybe some of them didn't care that much for the others, you know. But the, and that was it. So there was tradition, there was culture, there was ritual, and there's a, there's a, a cliché that can be used. Take what you want and leave the rest. But it all soaks in. It all soaks in. When I would sit next to my grandpa in the synagogue on... on the High Holy Days, or somebody's Bar Mitzvah, which really were the only occasions that I ever went to the synagogue, right? Even though my father went more often, but I didn't. Uh, his face lit up. But I always wondered, what are those women doing? And uh, Really, because this filters into digesting things, you know? My bar mitzvah, that was on uh, Grove Street, I did the whole thing. I had a, a Harlem boys choir, choir voice. I had an exquisite boy soprano voice. I didn't know it, but that's what it was. And phonetically, <laughs> I think some people might relate to that. The three seconds. It was beautiful. And I saw my grandpa, and I saw my father, and I looked up, and I saw a grandma, and all the people that were there, you know, it, it, it was something. So there was a lot to that, a lot of feeling to that. And then there was 
the man who prepped me for this, and that was Mr. Joseph Weinstein. I don't know if anybody remembers that man. If you don't, it's good that I'm going to tell you about him. Joseph Weinstein was an immigrant. By the way, uh, uh, so was my dad, So, and we'll, we'll talk about that. And he came over to this country, and uh, he was my Hebrew teacher to prep me for the bar mitzvah, okay? And I always wondered about something, because I think it was his left hand never left his pocket. And his right hand was like this. He had no fingers except for a gnarled thumb, okay? And I, I asked him, because, you know, I'm about to be 13, uh, I, I ask questions. Mr. Weinstein, what happened? Well, I guess my recollection is one of his jobs was in a sewing machine thing, and that's what did it, the needle got him everywhere. Well, without poor me it, without telling me his story, and this is what, what really soaks into people, I think, is I felt later on that I knew so much about this human being. And that's the way it was with, with Grandpa. And, he, and even on my mother's side, but there was a distance there because it was New Haven, and their stories were different from Grandpa Wise's and Grandma Wise's stories. That's my education. Uh, I guess it's time for a, a uh, some candor here. Everything else has been candor. I don't know that I ever believed in God. I can't say that I believed in God and then there came a time that I didn't or vice versa. But my story is, I don't think I was aware that there was such a thing, notwithstanding the orthodoxy of my grandpa. And that says a lot about him. That says a lot about him. Um, but when I would hear people invoke God, uh, you know, immigrant Jews, second generation Jews, first gen it doesn't matter, first generation Jews, Sometimes I would wonder how they saw God or what they thought was the role of God and everything like that. And, but they, they believed. And I couldn't. And I didn't. So I never did and I, and I don't now. Um, but I think my upbringing, I, I think the wonderful modeling for the most part and the opposite. And the opposite formed me in certain ways, uh, notwithstanding some serious mistakes I made in my own life, okay, that, that uh, taught me, think what you want, but be honest about what your true beliefs are, and walk the walk. I do. My father did, and my grandpa did. Okay, so I am Jew. I am a Jew, all right? Culture means a lot to me. Tradition means a lot to me. History means a lot to me. Family means everything to me without regard to the unhappinesses, the tragedies. The problems of living in that time was such a, a different world. I mean, even the present time, and even my own son. Yeah. Anyhow, uh, it's uh, it's you know we we were part of a dynamic, and uh, it, it was. The culture was changing. You know something? It's a digression, but it's important. I may have thoughts about certain people, certain groups of people uh, that come up from time to time. I 
don't express them. I have never told an ethnic joke. I have never used an ethnic slur. Not that I haven't thought about it sometime. I have never used dialect. I have never mimicked anything, anybody. And I have never allowed my children in my presence, this is as we speak, to do anything like that. And if they ever did, it was long, long ago, and they never have since. And I'm proud of that because I feel, and this is part of hopefully being Jewish or being religious or not being anything, that the, there's such a narrow sphere of influence that a person can have in the grand scheme of things, and it has to start with his or herself and then his or her own, and then it can branch out. But without him or herself, his or herself's own, nothing can branch out that's any good whatsoever. So the elements, I think, Many of the American Jews, second generation Jews that I know, many of them give back to the community, have a sense of family, enjoy music, all kinds, involvements, um, and I'll leave it at that. That's what, you, and take a stand if you've got the courage to do it, and I have more of that, and somehow or other had more of that growing up, than a lot of religious people of all religions. All right, I think we'll move on yes, to okay. a different period. <laughs> but uh, that's the yeah. truth. <laughs> uh, yeah, we, we, we'll... we'll uh, well, you decided to be a lawyer uh, because of... Yeah, he did it the right way. I know he always, my dad always wanted me to, just like he wanted my brother to be, you know. But I'm telling you, he never, listen, I was a C student in high school. All I cared about was baseball, but maybe I really was a C student, okay? And then uh, UConn accepted me. It's the only school I applied to because I was, it was a college and it, it mandated taking a student who graduated and lived in Connecticut. And what I really wanted to do was phys ed. That's what I really wanted to do. And I, and well, now I'm graduating, what am I going to do? You know, so I had no inclination to go to law school. So my dad said, well, well, really my mother, but maybe she, he put her up to it, who knows, you know. <laughs> Why don't you apply to law school? He said, just apply to BU. The fact that he was a graduate had nothing to do with that. It, it really did. Uh, he went to Brown, and after two years, he distinguished himself so much that he went after two years to BU. That's what happened there. And BU had, uh, historically, uh, takes three, uh, triple the, the first year enrollment, because they're going to knock two out, so they're going to get three for one and then balance it off, and that's how they make their money. So I got in, I graduated, uh, I have no idea, again, how, because I used to go to all the ball games and play sports and everything. I had enough to make the, to, to make the grades, but that was it. And uh, I actually, uh, I actually, and, and, the, and the, the town, the city was waiting, because George Wise was very well known, and Bob Wise, distinguish himself at Yale, coming out with the GI Bill, with the highest possible honors, undergrad, law school, and all the stuff that goes with it. I mean, incredible honors, right? <laughs> well, the kid brother didn't do anything like that, and he also flunked the bar exam the first time around. <laughs> so, you know, is the flag going to be at half mass or anything like that? But here's the thing, here's the thing. My my father said, did you give it everything you had first time around? I said, I thought I did that. I thought I did, and, and, uh, but uh, I didn't, evidently. I didn't. He said, uh, what do you think you can do uh, to 
be better prepared the next time for the bar exam. I said, well, maybe my brother can help me. But there was too much friction there. You know, he wanted to and I wanted it. I wanted it, but personalities and temperaments got in the way. I had a cousin Dick on my mother's side in New Haven who was the academic equal to my brother. And he said, Dave, you come to New Haven, I'll cram you for the next exam. And he prepped me and he said, uh, here's some questions, write down the answers. I wrote down the answers. He said, I don't know why you flunked. He says, you don't have a, these were all essay questions for the bar exam. He said, you know the principles of law, but you don't have a clue how to organize an answer. He took, and he pointed it out to me. When I saw what he said to me and what he did, I understood it. You know, there was a way of doing something. I didn't know it, or when it was told to me, I probably didn't pay attention. I know I aced it the second time, so I became a lawyer. Uh, my fallback position, if I failed that one, which I told my father, was I'm never going to take it the third time. <laughs> All you people who may be ashamed, which my mother was, but which my father wasn't, you'll just have to get over it, <laughs> you know, and so on. So I became a lawyer. And uh, it was a small town then, it remained a small town. Uh, my dad became a judge eight years after that. He didn't want to leave because how are his kids going to make it without him? We pointed out to him that we think we can, mm -hmm. that he gave us everything there is to give. He did well, we did well, and the story. Uh, in terms of the law practice, within were, it, were there any particular aspects that yeah, what interested me from day one, it was the only thing that I did well in law school, was moot court, trial. I did a lot of trial work. I had some very, very heavy criminal cases. I loved it. And uh, I was good at it. And, and uh, it felt good to, for me to say to myself, you know, there are some things that you're good at. That was one of them. And uh, uh, I did okay. I did okay. A lot of people uh, um, have told me that. So I sort of wondered in a little bit of, you know, what was health care like back then? What were the economics? How did the paint store do? You know, all of those pictures uh, as well as the community that was Stanford then. Okay. Uh, well, healthcare. Yeah. All right. Uh, the icon is Dr. Jake Moyne. And he did take care of me. And I remember the house on West Main, at the beginning of uh, West Main Street, I guess it is. And going in there, and seeing this house, it had a certain grandeur to it. I think he had, I know he started with a horse and carriage, but he ended it early on with an automobile. I remember the man making house calls, as doctors in those days did, but there was something about him, you know. He, he looked at you, he heard what you said, he heard what your parents said, and I know the, uh, that he was a revered man and by the entire town slash city of Stanford. Uh, one of the more important men in the history of Stanford was Dr. Jake Lemoyne. He passed it on to his son Bernie. I mean, Bernie was alive as a doctor with him for a while, and he helped me. He took care of me too. After that, it was whatever happens to kids and young grown-ups and their children. But that was the health care. Uh, and your mother needed to be on top of what's wrong with you, but sorting out what was really wrong and what she thought was wrong, <laughs> and uh, doing what mothers are supposed to do. The, the, uh, I said before that, well, I'll talk about the Depression. I'm born in 1929, so I'm a Depression baby, but who knew what that meant? No, no 1920, nine-year-old born person knows what that meant. Uh, I know we lived on Lafayette Street. I know we lived in a two-family house. Uh, I know that we ate. I know that I had clothes and all of that kind of stuff. Uh, I know my father didn't have a car. 
I know that at some point uh, he was around, but he wasn't a around as much. And a lot of people don't know this, but my father had a breakdown. Uh, and uh, I'm probably five or six. My brother is probably seven or eight, whatever it is. We're both pre-bar mitzvah, I'll tell you that. And uh, then he bounced back. And he told us what it was. Uh, you know, he, he never was an investor. He didn't own real estate. He didn't buy stocks or anything like that. But uh, he couldn't make it. So there were debts. And he paid them. And it took its toll. But he got through it. We never knew that. Um, there still is this office safe. It was always part of Wise and Wise. And the safe, uh, where, whenever we changed offices, the safe came with us. And one day, we're in an office. I mean, we are really adults bothering me. I probably was in my 50s, if not 60 or something. And he said, Dave, you got to see what's here in the safe. Well, I knew there was no money or stock or anything like that in here, right? Well, here's what it is, because you asked about the Depression and the economics. He found he found, and he's got them, because he's the older brother, <laughs> all right? He found check register and ledger for 1932, all right? I mean, you want to talk about a treasure. And this is where I learned what the Depression was. February 1932, on account, a dollar. On account, a dollar fifty, all right? You never saw something that reached $10 for any week and possibly not for any month. And in parentheses was the rent and $5 for the secretary, who had nothing to do, right? The secretary was uh, Edith Lemon, I remember her. And every week that had that parentheses, at some point later on in life, she got every one of those $5 payments even though she had gotten, you know, what her salary would be as times got better. And that told me what the Depression was. That told me what the Depression was. And there was one other thing that told me. We lived for a period of time on Rosie Road in Japan after we left Lafayette Street. And my father's, one of my father's joys, they had gone to Florida way, way after that. And he would always come back, and they would stay uh, sometimes with my brother, sometimes with uh, Sandy and me, but for months at a time. And his greatest pleasure, other than family, was uh, riding around for the changes in Stanford, and also where, where we lived. Okay, so we go down a go down a rosy road, and believe me, I, I must be in my 40s or maybe 50 or something like that. Who the heck knows? And we go down Rosy Road. And if you know Japan, the, the Long Island Sound's on both sides. He said, David, would you, were you happy here growing, uh, growing up? That's where we lived when Pearl Harbor came. And I, I, I said, yeah. I said, Dad, I never understood. Why did you sell this house? He says, I never sold it. My father had a great sense of humor. He said, I never sold it. I said, what are you talking about? I said, you still own it? He said, no, I don't own it. I said, Dad, I don't get it. He said, big shot lawyer, figure it out. I said, my goodness, you never owned it, did you? He says, no, rented it. I said, Dad, why? I mean, you bounced back. Where you... How much? $8,200. I know real money. I know real money. $8,200. You want to talk about an eye opener. What year was that? That was, well, it was pre uh, Pearl Harbor. Pre Pearl Harbor. Yeah. Pre Pearl Harbor. Mm -hmm. Imagine that. Imagine that. You know what? Uh, now, as far as the paint store was concerned, for years, uh, I'll tell you later how the family came, where they came from, and how they ended up there. When Grandpa Wise really began to be established, and his was the first, this is a source of pride to me, 
and all my Italian American West Side friends can't stand it. <laughs> he was on Pacific Street as the first paint store before Scalzi Paint Store got there. And I'm telling you, I'm, I never let him forget it. <laughs> in any event, he did what all merchants did in those days pay me what you can. And they lived above the store. And remember, I told you about the measure of a man? Even when times got better, when, when he was able to buy that property, this is a family history. I do not believe that it's myth, okay? From the time he bought that property to, to post-World War II, until money started to be coming in, he never ever raised the rent for anybody that lived there. Never. It's quite a, that's quite something. Um, the, so that's the economy, you know, I mean, as far as I know, when you walk downtown, uh, stores were open. That's what I saw. Uh, people found a way to continue in business on whatever terms allowed them to. That's, that's something. I, I don't know if people folded, but the, the long-time names that were generational, they continued to exist at all times until urban renewal came in, which to me absolutely destroyed the core of Stanford. Okay. Okay. Uh, how did the how did Grandpa Wise end up in Stanford? Uh, we're from Lithuania. He was a sign painter, a sign letterer, and a glazier there. Uh, they all survived whatever pogroms were going on. Then in 1899 or 1900 or 1901, I called my brother last night, he, th he, he thinks it's 1901, uh, they came to Stanford. They came here by way of every country you can think of and Canada. So, the wises are illegal. <laughs> That's it. We're illegal. Uh, proudly illegal, okay? And he went to the Lower East Side. He had no relatives in Stanford, Connecticut. No, uh, to my recollection, no relatives. By the way, I asked my father so much, what was it like when you were there? Do you have any memories? But he was too young. He was about two or three years old, I guess, when he came here. But he, um, a very open man, was never able or willing to tell me about what it was like for him to grow up. So there must have been some heavy stuff. Uh, Grandpa never told me stories about Lithuania, and I was too young to ask him those stories. And by the time I really wished I had, it was too late to ask him those stories. So he went to the Lower East Side, didn't like what he saw, because he said no matter what was going on there, this I know, um, he left better, <laughs> except, for the, except he wanted to live. <laughs> and did a little scouting and followed the trolley tracks, ended in Stanford, Connecticut. That's how we got to Stanford, Connecticut and uh, found a little thing to start getting into business, and it grew from there. Okay, let's uh, jump in time. Uh, you mentioned urban renewal. Uh, what do you see as the positive aspects that came out of the transition in Stanford? Well, there are some. I mean, there's no doubt about that. I mean, if you want to talk about things that you can see, uh, that th those speak for themselves. Um, there's a uh, there's a, a uh, disconnected um, uh, vibrancy. Restaurants come and go. Uh, events come and go. 
there's no common thread as far as I'm concerned. The, um, when I said that the core was displaced, it was. You had, I mean, you had Frank West Hard for Hardware, you had Mantell and Martin, you had uh, uh, the Robin Umbrella Shop, and, and, and you had uh, 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 a fine shoe store. Uh, you had Rovins, you had Charlax, you had, uh, I, it goes on and on and on, okay? You had, you had places that were created by the people that came to this town from all these other countries. And while they all had their own churches and synagogues and religions and neighborhoods and everything and the friction that may accompany that, there was a center, you know, and it's not living in the past, but the feeling has never, never been replaced. That's a loss, and it has proven to be irretrievable, in my opinion. Uh, a newer church, a newer synagogue, a newer this, a newer that, a newer school, a private this, a public, it, it's, it had to be, I guess, and the whole basic premise of it, and then my last word on it, okay, uh, was what, will, what it will do for the growth of Stanford, the vibrancy of Stanford, but, and the tax base of Stanford, all of which has not proven out. And what happened to the displaced people? Where did they go to live? What kind of housing came in for them when they had their own housing to begin with? What happened to the businesses? You tell me. What happened to Pacific Street? Think about it. So that's my take on urban and the land grabs that went on and all that kind of stuff. Anyhow, so anyway, we'll yeah. <laughs> but uh, we have seen uh, the Stanford Center for the Arts, you know, and all of the the Hartman. So there, there, and the uh, so there's been an active theater group. Here in town. Yes, but urban renewal had nothing to do with the Stanford Theater Works under CAR, had nothing to do with Curtain Call, nothing to do with the Queskin Theater, uh, not, it had everything to do with the two things you mentioned and where are they today. So there, anyhow, <laughs> we could go on for more, <laughs> but we won't. <laughs> uh, one, well, let's uh, get back to how you, uh, uh, how you met your wife, how you raised your family, things of that okay. direction. Okay, okay. So, uh, I was accepted mandatorily at UConn. And uh, the, the, the woman that I married got there two years after I did. And we met. Uh, as a matter of fact, see, I graduated in in 50. That's when I graduated. She got there in 48. So I guess we met in her, maybe her senior year or something, or just before I left. And uh, somehow or other it took. She's a West Haven girl. Her mom and dad, who I called mom and dad, uh, they both came but independent of each other from Russia. He came and landed, because he had countrymen, in uh, Spring Hill, Tennessee. So you talk about a combination of a y'all with a Russian, and it was great. It was great. My mother-in-law had a sister here when she was 13. Uh, you had to get out of Russia at that point. Or you may not live to tell the story. She didn't know a word of English. She got on that boat by herself at 13 years of age and went to New Haven, Connecticut, okay? Which is where my mother and her family, my grandma and grandpa are from, by way of Russia. Um, my father-in-law, 
dad, Papa Barney, he wanted a wife. He, he was the Sam Levinson of his day. A backpack to a cart to, a, to an automobile mm -hmm. down, down there. But he felt he, he wanted a wife, came up to New Haven, and, and uh, that's how they met. That's how they met. Sandy and I uh, talk about two kids. 23 and 21 when we got married, and, and me, and that's the chronological age, maybe not the true developmental age, <laughs> but um, we made it. We had five children, one of them died, so uh, we have four children, they're all grown up naturally, and uh, we have uh, uh, one granddaughter and one grandson. We both, particularly in our later years, and this is part of, it's not confined to being Jewish, but it's part of being Jewish as far as I'm concerned, really have given back to this community. Uh, not out of the pocketbook. Uh, together and separately. She co-facilitated groups at the Sexual Assault Christ Center. I started and co-facilitated groups there. She's a caregiver and a caretaker in the Parkinson Support Group. She and I co-facilitated groups, now this isn't just for one year, okay, at the Den for Grieving Kids, if you know anything about that. Um, trying to think of other, she's a library volunteer uh, at, the, at the bookstore. There are other things, I guess some of them escape me. For me, in addition to what I've told you, voluntary services for the blind, teaching English as a second language, and because of history in our own family, my own, her and my downward family, I don't know whether it still exists at the Stanford Jewish Center, but I started the first Al-Anon group at the Stanford Jewish Center. I approached the board and they gave me the room. Because I knew, I knew that there had to be a need for something like that. But it's an, it's, Al-Anon is really can be called non-denominational. It isn't necessarily non-denominational, but there's a lot to it that people want some of it. Okay. And I felt that if there was one there, there might be people who show up uh, who might benefit from it. And it, that proved to be the case for a number of years. So that's um, our involvement as far as the community is concerned. There was a particular incident in my life, it happened 24 years ago, I'll keep it personal, but I paid, I paid, uh, and I'm not ashamed, but I paid. Uh, I, uh, I see myself uh, as, a, uh, as a man, and I see my wife as a woman slash man, a real person, so, and some of my kids are like that. <laughs> uh, given that this is for the Historical Society and so on, mm -hmm. uh, I thought I should raise the issue of Zionism and get your comments on Israel, Zionism, and so forth. Um, We used to hover when Pearl Harbor happened. We all knew what was happening in Germany before we went to war. We all knew. And when, when Pearl Harbor came, every neighborhood lost sons. Lafayette Street lost Bobby Wasserman. I don't know if his name has ever come up in any of these matters, but Bobby Wasserman lived on Lafayette Street, 
Bobby Wasserman was killed in the Philippines. All right. Uh, Bobby Wasserman was a rank, nationally ranked tennis player at either UCLA or USC, and he was kept off the Davis Cup, just like Marty Glickman wasn't allowed to run. All right. Strangely enough, I felt a sense of pride accompanying the sadness when I learned that he died because he was an American Jew. Jack Singer, another name, same thing, same thing. We used to listen to the radio because there were occasions when our manufacturing war machinery could get into place and the bombing of Germany started to place. Somehow or ever, some of the communications on the radio, bomber to bomber, you could pick up. And we heard the, we heard the conversation, we heard the bombs drop. I'm a kid, all right? And now I'm learning more and more what happened. And then what happened after. And the resistance that was made that took place that nobody really gave a good goddamn in truth, okay? And that led me to hear about the Irgun and the Haganah and all this kind of stuff, and the partition and the Balfour Declaration and all of this kind of stuff. And who couldn't? Who couldn't? Yes, you know? But I have strong feeling about the religious right there as I have about the religious right here, and it sours everything. Okay? It does. I guess this is a good point to let you have your reflections and so on, and give you a, you know, a reasonable amount. Oh, okay. I, I, when, uh, I, I told you initially that I regarded my grandfather, or even on the information sheet, and my father as the two most important people in my life, and they were, and they remain that way. When Grandpa came here, he, he was very important in the Jewish community, very, very important, along with others, obviously, okay? And I know, that's why I made some notes, he was there for the 1904 cornerstone for Aguda Shalom. He was there for the uh, cornerstone and the opening in 1928 of the Stanford Jew uh, Jewish Center on Grove Street. When I mean he was there, it wasn't a, a photo op. He was part of it with that generation of people, okay? And he was there for where I got, a a after the the uh, Grey Rock Place uh, uh, synagogue burned. He was there for the opening, for the beginning of and the opening of the 1930, 1932 Grove Street. So his, his contribution along with those others, co-equal men, okay, co-equal families, I treasure that. I treasure that, and I, and I wanted that to be known. Uh, my father, uh, the money ran out after his first year of, at Brown, and there was no way that Grandpa Wise could get him back. My father's classmates, there was a lot of money there in Brown, among some families, they came to Stanford and they went to see Mr. Wise. And they said, we will lend you the money to pay for George. He's going to, and they did, and Grandpa, of course, paid him back. Okay? I mean, wow. Okay? All right. When my dad graduated and became a lawyer, um, at that time, until sometime in the 40s, I guess, Stanford had a divided government. There was a town of government and the city, town of Stanford. My father was uh, town council under George Barrett. When the consolidation came, my father was the first corporation council for Stanford, and um, a very well respected man, and, and deservedly so, in all respects of his life. 
Well, when Louis Claps became mayor the first term, his first corporation council was my brother Bob. And that's why my brother agreed to be the corporation council, because <laughs> my dad was alive, for goodness sakes, you can imagine uh, the pleasure of all of that. When I always wondered, I always wondered, how could I have the last name Wise coming from Lithuania? Because that's not possible, all right? But I never asked my, my dad about that. Now, I saw my Uncle Sam's yearbook. I still have it, but unfortunately. Oh, I think I gave it to the society. If not, I will. Um, his name is spelled W-I-S-E in it. Little four-page yearbook. My father's name is spelled W-E-I-S-S -S in his. You know, you know, what kind of nonsense is this? Uh, the, the, the fact is, that there were people in this town by the name of Warsaw. Some were Warsaw, some were Warsaw, and some were Warsaw. When I was born, my middle name is Maxwell. Well, there was a Max Warsaw, and you know, that, uh, like a second cousin, they wanted, hey, oh, no worse way that I would be Max. Well, my parents said, no. Nah, the only thing we'll do with you is we'll give it, we'll, we'll let that be his middle name. That's how I got my middle name. So where does a Warsaw thing come in? Well, the years go by, the years go by, and uh, my cousin Dick dies. That left Bob and me. Joy Moltash was the surviving wife of Dick Wise, Sam's son. She took Grandpa Wise's original passport, which we didn't even know exist. She refuses to this day to give it to Bob or to me, but what can we do? I'm going to get a copy, and if I get it, I turn it over. Well, I saw a copy. She did get a copy. I think I misplaced it. I'll recover that fumble. And I looked at it. That's how I know we came in from Canada. And that's how I knew, know that my Aunt Faye was born in this country. Gedalia, George, and Shmuel, Sam. Our last name was phonetically Vorshevsky. Made a lot of sense to me. <laughs> By that time, of course, we had five children who were well established. And I said to Sandy, and I mean it to this day, did not have children, I would have changed my name right back to Vorshevsky. I absolutely would have done it. So that's, I told you about my grandpa, the community man and a man, and my father, the community man and a man. Uh, I do want to tell you, and I told you that sometimes you get marked in certain ways, and what it was really like because not everybody experiences the same thing in any part of the same town. Um, people remember, I hope, the Brooklyn Eagle and uh, Father Coughlin and the vitriol and venom that spewed out of that man's mouth and out of the editorial pages of that newspaper. I hope they remember the American Nazi Party headed by uh, Charles Lindbergh. I hope they remember uh, the Vatican. I hope they remem remember everything. But I remember St. Mary's Church. And they had a mini Father Coughlin. They did. And I heard it. That's why religion is a word to me better used with a small r than a capital r. I told you about Miss Gallagher, I told you about the kid, you know, back and forth, events like that. Every kid's had a lot of that. I don't, I don't care who you were or where country you came from, you all had stuff like that. And, uh, you know, uh, 
the Irish owned the police department, the Italians were treated like crap, but everything seemed to even out at a certain point in time, and that's okay. I had a history teacher, I think it was the sixth grade, Rogers, name of Joseph Franchina. He became the superintendent of schools in this town, all right? So, <laughs> he's, he's, he's now teaching, he's American history, and he's, he's now at the Civil War. <laughs> and he said to the class, well, tell me class, something like this, why was the Civil War fought? What brought it about? So some kids said, you know, uh, Something to do with cotton, something to do with the economy. Before kids could get through saying, hey, oh, oh, no. It was to free the niggers. Any member that, of that class or any living human being that wants to challenge me on the accuracy of that quote is free to do so. Well, wow. I wonder what happened in other classrooms, <laughs> but that's the kind of poison that when a person from within is a poisonous person, that's, that's the kind of stuff that can happen. As far as, you know what, uh, that's it, that's it, unless you want to ask anything more. Well, I want to thank you for this contribution to the oral history. I think for our initial version, you've been a wonderful guinea pig, <laughs> and well, we appreciate it. And uh, it's uh, very nice that, that we have something positive to look forward to. Well, thank, thank you. you. It was a thanks a lot. Wonderful experience for me too.